Sadaqallahuladheem, verily Allah has spoken the truth. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is traditional for us to open our gatherings with a recital of portions from the Holy Quran. The duty tonight was performed by 13-year-old Ihsan Talib of Lansdowne. MashaAllah, I'm sure you will agree with me. The rendering was beautiful. We welcome one and all of you here 
tonight in retreat to a lecture by Brother Ahmad Didat of Durban. Ahmad Didat is well known for this type of lectures and we are indeed fortunate to have the opportunity during these two weeks, this week and next, to have him with us so soon after a visit he paid on the lecturing tour to the Arab countries. Our lecture tonight is on Muhammad, peace be upon him, the greatest. It follows on Monday's lecture, which was in Weinberg, on what the Bible says about Muhammad. We then went on to Rocklands in Mitchell's Plain last night, where the topic was Muhammad, peace be upon him, the natural successor to Christ. We invite you to all the other lectures which will take place tomorrow night, Friday, Saturday, Monday and Tuesday in various other centers which include Lansdowne, the City Hall in Cape Town, Athlone Civic Center and Kensington. There will be freedom for you if you wish to bring tape recorders with and even video cameras if the authorities at the hall allow you to do that but from our side there is no copyrights on it you're free to make your own copies we have to clear the hall at about half past ten after the lecture tonight you are free to come up to the microphone and put questions to the speaker after the lecture, I will again give you an indication and an idea as to how we would like you to conduct the question time. I give to you now Brother Ahmad Didat. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَزِيرًا وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرِ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ صدق الله صدق الله من العظيم Mr. Chairman Brothers and Sisters I have read to you a verse from Surah Safa verse number 28 and as I had explained to you previously how to find this chapter and this verse from the Holy Quran that is available to you from here as our chairman had announced again and again seven rands fifty each or two for ten rands it's a bargain of a lifetime I assure you two thousand pages for five rands each if you buy two but now at the end of this volume is a very comprehensive index and if you open that index under S you'll find Safa it will be in italics every surah name of the surah under whatever the name under that letter alf alphabet you'll find it in italics is the name of the surah and it will tell you is surah Saba is 34 so you look for chapter 34 surah is chapter and look for verse 28 and you'll find this verse I have just read to you. The meaning of that is, Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَافَةَ لِلنَّاسِ said, we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except for the whole of mankind. كَافَةَ لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا as a giver of glad tidings, وَنَزِيرًا and as a warner, but the bulk of mankind they still do not know that is the meaning of the verse I have read to you with regards to the subject Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the greatest you see it is very easy for one to elevate to praise his hero 
his saint, his imam, his prophet, very easy to idolize our great men, very easy. And we all have a tendency to do that, whether Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Jew. That whom do you esteem to be the greatest person? So each will give his hero according to his knowledge and experience. I had an occasion to take a Portuguese couple around the mosque in Durban. I happened to be one of the guides to the Juma Masjid Durban, and it attracts a lot of visitors. So we take them around, explain to them what goes on, and we give them free literature. But talking to this Portuguese couple, the Portuguese gentleman, somehow the subject arose, and he was telling me that the greatest man that ever lived was Dr. Salazar. Have you heard of him? Dr. Salazar. Bulk of the people, they have never heard the name, Dr. Salazar. But you can't take exception to his claim because he only knows Dr. Salazar. Can you see? To him, Portuguese gentleman, he must have done great work for his nation. He is the greatest man that ever lived, Dr. Salazar. So it's quite easy for one to idolize one's own hero. But if the tribute, the praise, the testimony comes from the opposite camp, that would be testimony indeed. We praise our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Christian praises Jesus Christ, the Hindu praises Rama and Krishna. It's natural. But if the enemy praises your hero, then that is real praise indeed. You agree? Coming from the enemy. And in that regard, a book has just been published in America. The title of that book is The Hundred. See this book? Quite an expensive book. The Hundred. Alternatively described as the top hundred or the greatest hundred in history. The author is a certain Michael H. Hart, described as an astronomer and a mathematician. This American, he goes out of his way to search in history for the hundred most influential men from Adam alayhi salam, from Adam, up to current times. And he gives us a list of those hundred most influential men according to his reasoning. He gives reasons behind every person that he chooses. Why he chose this number one and why he chose that number 30 and why he chose that number 100. He gives you reasons. And the amazing thing about his list is this. That number one on his list, you can guess, is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number one, Muhammad. An American in America writing a book which retails in America for $12.50, 572 pages. Who will buy his book? The 200 million nominal Christians of America or the 6 million Jews, not Pakistanis, Bangladeshis or Arabs. Oh, they'll buy one here, one there. But the bulk of his customers will be the Americans. The market is the American market, Christians and Jews. And he's telling them that Muhammad, the member of their opposition, is the first man, the greatest man, most influential man in history. And the shocking thing about his list is this, that his own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is number three. His own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is number three, not even number two. And he gives his reasons for that also. He said, you see, the honor for Christianity, or whatever it is, is to be divided between Paul and Christ. And he said that the real founder of Christianity is not Jesus Christ, is Saint Paul. He wrote more books. The New Testament consists of 27 books. 27 different books, out of which more than half, 14 are written by this one man, Paul, Saint Paul. 
the self-appointed apostle of Jesus. Self-appointed. He didn't go and choose him. He chose 12. But the self-appointed apostle, as he claims, Paul, he wrote 14 out of 27 books, more than half. And everything that the Christian is preaching today is not the preachings of Jesus, are not the teachings of Jesus, are the teachings of Paul. See, whenever we are having an argument with the Christian, we are asking him, do you keep the laws and the commandments? Because Jesus said so. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Do you keep the laws and the commandments? He said, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments or shall teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Do you keep the laws and the commandments? He says, no. So why don't you? So he says, no, the law is nailed to the cross. He said, we are now living under grace. I said, where did you get that? So he says, Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians. So what's all that? Who's that? He says, this is Paul, Paul, Paul. So what did your master say? No, they don't talk about the master, Jesus. But they don't talk about him. Paul, Paul, Paul. If they contradict you in anything, it's Paul. The real founder of Christianity is Saint Paul. So, this man, Michael, at heart, he gives the honor. Had it not been, he would have come number two, Jesus Christ. But since the honor is divided, he goes to number three. So I'm asking, please account for it. Why should an American in America publish a book he wants to do business? And he's provoking his customers. You see, in business, we say that the customer is always right. You must appease your customers. If you want to do business, you must please your customers. You don't argue and debate with your customers. Others, they won't come back. But this man is telling his customers that they are all wrong. And he's right. Muhammad number one, Jesus Christ number three. Now, if a Christian confirms what Allah Baritala has already told us in the Holy Quran, he says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ He says, most certainly thou, o Muhammad, standest on the highest pinnacle of behavior. It makes us happy that a Christian in America, he goes to confirm what the Quran stated 1400 years ago. But the problem is, I say, account for it. We are asking the unbeliever, account for this. Why should he go out of his way and provoke his customers? So some cynic, cynic, you know, jocular fellows, sarcasm. They say maybe some Arab might have bribed this fellow. You know, the Arabs are very rich. They have just run into money, petrodollars, you know, petrodollars. It's quite easy for an Arab. You know, one of our brethren, our brethren, He's married to a woman from Johannesburg, a white woman from Johannesburg. And she boasts about her illegitimate daughter, that woman, the wife of Adnan Khushoggi. So our brother Adnan, he was spending $30,000 an hour for his wife to see color TV on her yacht in the Mediterranean. She could have seen black and white, but it wasn't good enough for her. She must see color TV. But with who? With her boyfriend, Rudolf Churchill. And our brother is paying for that. Our brother is paying $30,000 an hour to beam by satellite, especially for his wife to enjoy with her boyfriend in the yacht. Another of our brethren, he goes to the Australian waters to do fishing. Blue marlin, you know, it's that game fish. You might have seen it on TV. When you hook that, it flies out of the water like a bird. And it, you know, it's a fighting fish. So he went to catch blue marlin in the Australian waters. He didn't catch anything, poor fellow. But the people who helped him to bait the hook, he gave them $2,000 each. Tip, $2,000 each. Look, if our brothers can do that, why can't they give 10000 to Michael at heart? He said, look, man, you're writing a book. What about putting in a few good words for my Muhammad? I say it's possible, but it's not probable. It wouldn't enter the minds of our brethren to do such things. Then in the Times magazine, July 15, 1974, there were a series of essays under the heading, Who Were History's Great Leaders? Who Were History's Great Leaders? The first one was about the most influential men in history. Now the question is, the great leaders in history. 
So different people were questioned, religious men, mathematicians, psychologists, military men. Who do you think was the greatest leader of all time? You. Who do you think was the greatest leader of all times? And each according to his knowledge and experience, like that Portuguese gentleman I referred to you, they gave the heroes. Some said Mahatma Gandhi, some said Confucius, some said Hitler. Not good or bad. We are not talking about good or bad. But from the point of view of leadership, the guy was great. 90 million Germans at his bidding, death or destiny, and they led, he led them to destruction. 90 million, they marched into Russia. When they marched into Russia, they destroyed 20 million Russians, 2,000 kilometers nonstop. Look, as a leader, the guy was great. Good or bad, we are not talking about that. Leadership. Some say Mussolini, from the point of view of leadership, the guy was great. Each giving his hero according to his experience and background, his knowledge. Among these contributors, there is one James Gavin. He is described as a United States Lieutenant General, retired. He says, this is an American, in that article he says, among leaders who made the greatest impact through the ages, I would consider, number one, Guess who? Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Number one, Muhammad. And as a Christian, he says, number two, Jesus Christ. Do you blame him? But I says, account for that. Why should he put our Nabi Kareem, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, number one, and his own God and Savior, number two? Which Arab bribed him? I don't know. Then there is another contributor to those articles by the name of Jews Masarman. He is described as a United States psychoanalyst. And you know the psychoanalyst, the job is to analyze the minds of men. And when they find a genius, they're looking for lunacy in the man. Because we are told that the difference between a genius and a lunatic is a very thin veil dividing the two. You know, just a little over, you are a lunatic, and a little this side, you are a genius. So in every genius, they look for lunacy. That is the job of the psycho psychiatrist psychoanalyst and he is a professor of the Chicago University professor of psychology he says that before you confer greatness upon any leader or would-be leader we must first find out what we are looking for in the man you just don't say this guy or that guy or that guy we want to know what we are looking for in the man and he gives us three objective standards number one he says that that person, whoever he is, number one, he must provide for the welfare of the lead. He's interested in your welfare, not in milking cows for himself, like Reverend Jim Jones. Reverend Jim Jones in Guyana. You know, he committed suicide with 910 of his followers. 911, 100% suicide. Not one guy was left alive. He made them to commit suicide because he was doing things wrong and he was being discovered. So he wanted to get rid of all evidence against him. And what better way than mass suicide? They call it the suicide cult. 100%. They wipe themselves out. But in the meantime, it was discovered that this man, Reverend Jim Jones, had salted away in the banks of the world $15 million in his own account. So those, his followers were his milking cows. He was using them, using them. And he was now being found out, discovered. Said so, no, this leader, whoever he is, number one, he must provide for the welfare of the lead. He is interested in your welfare. Number two, he must provide a social organization in which people feel relatively secure. Like our community. When you visit, visit one another, you know, when you visit a Muslim brother, he invites you, if he's eating, so come on, sit down to eat. If nothing, he said, right, look, have some coke. Have a cup of tea, have some bhajiyas, have some samosas, have some kusistas. Look, innocent, innocent enjoyment. The other community says, look, what about a drink? Brandy? What? You know, you see these advertisements. It says, down a lion and feel satisfied. <laughs> you seen that? Down a lion means lion beer, not that lion that in the bushes is. That's too, too dangerous. Down a lion and feel satisfied. The other guy says, Big advertisements, huge placards. He said, don't be vague, say Hague. <laughs> the 
And you know, the French, they beat the lot, the Frenchmen. There was a huge hoarding advert in Durban, 30 feet by 10 feet. And there were only three words, only three words on that advert. And what an impact those three words had. You know what it was? They had the lips of a woman, well lipstick, with a gleaming teeth, and with one grape, you only see the grape in the two fingers, and she's just about putting the grape in her mouth, that's all. But you don't see her hands, nothing. You, don't see, you only see the lips, beautiful lipstick lips, and the grape, and the gleaming teeth. And it's written, France, wine country, that's all. In other words, if you are a connoisseur, if you have that aptitude for that sort of stuff, when you go to France, what will you think of? Drink, drink, drink. Only three words. France, wine country. He says, no. This person, you see, this Islam that made it so, that we have innocent enjoyments. You don't want to go and dance with your brother's wife? Hmm? Or somebody, you want to take her to the dance? You want to do this? You want to drink? What for? No. We have innocent enjoyments. Eh? Provides a, a society in which people feel relatively secure. Number three, and that person must provide for unity of belief. Well, what are our little differences? We have our arguments and our debates on the size of the beard. Say, Mashallah, you got a nice beard, but why don't you make it standard size, my brother? <laughs> hmm? This brother here is so old, I said, look man, when are you going to start keeping one? And so on and so on. You see this moustache of yours? You are not supposed to shave. You are supposed to clip it. Do you know that? So we, we enjoy these luxuries. These are luxuries which we enjoy. We have our debates and our arguments. But as a people, as a whole, thousand million, we are agreed on Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That we testify that there is but one Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, the last and final messenger of God. On that, the whole Muslim world, Alhamdulillah, we are agreed with the Sunni or Shia. We are agreed. There is but one Allah and Muhammad is his messenger and is the last and final messenger of God. Unity of belief. With these three standards, he searches history. And he analyzes Louis Pasteur, the guy who discovered the microbe. Salk, he analyzes Salk, who discovered the anti-TB vaccine. And he analyzes Mahatma Gandhi, and Confucius, and Moses, and Jesus. And he comes to the conclusion that the greatest leader of all time was who? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This Jew, a paid servant of the American government, he said the greatest leader of all time was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And to a lesser degree, whatever Muhammad did, he said Moses did the same. His hero comes number two. We take off our hat to the man, shouldn't we? Look, what made him to say that? Unless it must be so. Or oh, tell me some Arab bribed him as well. Possible, but not probable. But let's go back. You see, today the Muslim world, these are our Arab brethren, Alhamdulillah, they have run into money, you see. They don't know what to do with it. They run amok with their money. Here's human trait, human weakness. But 144 years ago, almost exactly 144, one gross, 12 dozen years ago. 8th of May, Friday, 8th of May, 19, 1840, I'm sorry, 1840. 8th of May, Friday, 1840. An Anglican Christian in England by the name of Thomas Carlyle described as one of the greatest thinkers of the past century, Thomas Carlyle. He wrote a book called Heroes and Hero Worship. It was a textbook for metric students some years ago. I don't know whether they still prescribe that. Beautiful literature. So he wrote a book on heroes and hero worship. And he chose our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his hero prophet. Not Moses, not David, not Solomon, not Jesus, but Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as his hero prophet. And he explains to his Anglican audience, because at that time in history, it was a sacrilege to say anything good about the prophet of Islam. It was, it was the worst crime, worst blasphemy. Any Christian can do is to say anything good about the holy prophet Muhammad. At that time in history, that's 144 years ago, 
he's telling, addressing his audience, trying to pacify them. He says, as there is no danger now of any of us ever becoming Mohammedans, there's no danger, he's got no fear that anybody might become Mohammedans. This is the term he used, you see. Mohammedans, I mean to say all the good things about him that I justly can, because there's no fear that any of you will become Mohammedans, who is Anglican audience. Because as he says, Thomas Carlyle, that the people were trained to hate the man Muhammad and his religion. They were trained like dogs are trained in South Africa to hate black men. They are trained. There is a system of training. You can train dogs to hate all black people. You don't know. So the Christian world was trained to hate the man Muhammad and his religion. So now he's making a start, making a breakthrough. So he has to appease them. So look, don't worry. I know nobody will be converted to Mohammedanism. Of course, there is no such thing as a Mohammedan. You know that. And there is no such thing as Mohammedanism. These are misnomers. These terms were invented by the Westerner. The Christian world, they invented these terms. Because they reasoned that since they are the worshippers of Christ, so they are Christians. The worshippers of Christ are Christians. The worshippers of Buddha are Buddhists. So the worshippers of Muhammad must be Mohammedans. Now you see, that's how they reason. And we were also ignorant. We didn't know. When I was small, we didn't know. You know, our masjid, West Street Mosque was Mohammedan Mosque. Our Brook Street Cemetery, the main cemetery in Durban was Mohammedan Cemetery. We didn't know. Because the white man says, calls us Mohammedan, Mohammedan, so he says, we are Mohammedan. At school, when I was a young fellow, I remember, you know, I used to wear that, um, that Turkish face, you know, the red one, that our Malay brethren wear, and I saw them on TV singing that, some funny, funny thing, you know. The... <laughs> but with that, but well, we used to wear that, you see. Those are fashionable, the Turks, you know, our brethren, they were one time leading Muslim nation, so we used to wear the red faces. So we go to school, red face on. So the teacher tells all the students, take off your hats. Caps or hats, take them off. So everybody takes it off. The Hindus, the Christians, they take it off. We keep it on. We say, we are Mohammedan, sir. <laughs> that, that's actually what you said. We are Mohammedan, sir, so we don't take off our hats. All the boys they must wear knickers. We wear long pants. Why? Because we are Mohammedan, sir. We didn't know, we didn't know, wallah we didn't know, now we know better, alhamdulillah. But this poor man, in 1840, he says, no fear, anybody becoming Mohammedan, so he wants to do justice to this man. And he's quoting a westerner, a writer of his day, you know, a very popular writer of his day, by the name of Pop Cocky. Now this Pop Cocky wrote the story of our Nabi. And in that story he wrote, that Muhammad, وسلم, he had trained pigeons to pick up peas from his ears. Peas. You know pea? In his ear he used to put and he trained the pigeon to take it out. Which he told the people that's Jibreel, you know, giving him wahi, revelation. This khabis, that khabis, that's what he wrote in his book. So he was asked, he said, where did you get this? Information that Muhammad had trained pigeons to pick up peace from his ears, which he gave off as revelation. He said, no, no way. But he said, look, after all, you must have some authority for making statements. He said, no, I just felt like writing it. That's all. This is how they were trained to hate the man Muhammad and his religion, as dogs are trained to hate black men. So this Thomas Carlyle, speaking about our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa you know, beautiful words he writes. He says about our Nabi, a poor, hard, toiling, ill-provided man, careless, careless of what vulgar men toil for. He's not worried about things that men, vulgar men toil for. Not a bad man, I should say. Something better in him than hunger of any sort. Or these wild Arab men fighting and jostling three and twenty years at his hand, in close contact with him always, would not have reverenced him so, would not have reverenced him so. They were wild men. These Arabs, they said they were wild men, bursting ever and anon into quarrel, into all kinds of fierce sincerity, without right worth 
and manhood. No man could have commanded them. Without that quality of sincerity, integrity, manhood, he said no man could have commanded them. They called him prophet, you say. This is why he stood there face to face with them, bare, not en enshrined in any mystery, visibly clouting his own clothes, cobbling his own shoes, fighting, counseling, ordering in the midst of them. They must have seen what kind of a man he was. Let him be called what you like. Call him what you like. No emperor with his tyras was obeyed as this man in a cloak of his own clouting. During three and twenty years of rough actual trial, I find something of a veritable hero necessary for that of itself. A Muslim describes it, that Marde Kamil, that perfect man. Allah says, Lakat kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana. So most certainly in the apostle of Allah, you have the best example. This is in 1840. 1840. 14 years later, in 1854, a Frenchman writes the history of the Turks by the name of Lamartine, a Frenchman. And in, incidentally, the Turks being Muslim, so he starts speaking about our Nabi. He says something. And he gives us three other objective standards. Now this is something great about the Westerner. He's looking for angles which, he didn't, which we didn't think before. Jews, Masserman, he says, no, those three qualities. This man is talking about other three qualities. And his qualities he's giving is, he says, number one, if greatness of purpose, what the man is out to do. Allah says, we have not sent you, but as a mercy unto the whole of mankind, the whole universal man. Alameen of the worlds. Alam means the world, and Alameen means the worlds. Not only physical world, spiritual world, every type of creation. That's his purpose in life, as a mercy unto the whole of mankind. Not for Jews, or not for Hindus, or Arya Samaj. He is for the whole of mankind. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. This is how he starts. All praise is due to Allah, the Lord and cherisher of the world not of the Arabs, or the Pakistanis, or the Malaysians. No, no, no. Alameen, greatness of purpose, smallness of means. You know how he starts? Before he's born, his father dies. By the time he's six, his mother dies. His grandfather starts looking after the, the little infant child, and before long, grandfather dies. Then by the time he's 12, his uncle Abu Talib's goats is looking after. This is the beginning, smallness of means. No political party to back him up. No royalty to back him up. It's one man against all men. One man against the whole world. Nobody, his own people were not prepared to receive his message. From the word go, trials and tribulations, you know his history. Smallness of means and outstanding results. Today, 1,000 million Muslims. Christianity boasts 1,200 million, but they had 600 years they were ahead of us. But an American, in his book, The Messenger, Bodley, Bodley, in his book, The Messenger, he says that there are more professing Christians in the world than professing Muslims. Professing means people who s fill census forms. So what religion you belong to? Even if he's an atheist, he will say Christian. He won't say Jew because he's not a Jew. He wants a Hindu, he was not a Hindu. He was a Christian. You know, coming from a Christian background, he says Christian. So from that point of view, there are more Christians in the world today. There are more professing, people who say with the lips, there are more professing Christians than professing Muslims. But there are more practicing Muslims in the world than practicing Christians, people who practice the religion. Alhamdulillah. There are more Muslims who practice. We have our shortcomings. But as a people, as a whole, there are more practicing Muslims in the world today than practicing Christians. This is what Bodley says in his book, The Messenger. Outstanding results are the three criteria of human genius. So who could dare to compare any great man in modern history with Muhammad? He dares bring your candidate. 
Any man, bring him. Compare with this man, Muhammad. Who could dare to compare? He is daring you. Bring yours to compare with this man. This is the most famous men, talking about others, created arms, arms, armies, laws and empires only. They found that if anything at all, no more than material powers, which often crumbled away before their eyes, like Hitler's power, crumbled away before his own eyes. Hit Mussolini's power crumbled away before his eyes. Mikado's Japan crumbled away before his very eyes. Crumbled away before their eyes. This man, Muhammad, is a moved not only armies, legislations, empires, peoples and dynasties, but millions of men. And more than that, he moved the gods, the gods of the people, he moved them out of the way. The gods, the religions, the ideas, the beliefs and the souls. And he ends his beautiful tribute by saying, philosopher, orator, apostle, legislator, warrior, conqueror of ideas, the restorer of rational beliefs, of a cult without images, the founder of 20 terrestrial empires and of one spiritual empire. That is Muhammad. That is Muhammad. With regards to all standards, all standards whereby human greatness may be measured, we may well ask, is there any man greater than he? Is there? The answer is in the question. The answer is in the question he's asking. In other words, he's saying, no man greater than Muhammad The greatest man that ever lived was Muhammad I'm asking, who bribed Lama Deen? Who bribed him? Which Arab? The whole Muslim world was down in the gutters. In 1854, the whole Muslim world, except for three or four Muslim countries, nominally independent, every Muslim nation was under subjugation. India was under the British. Indonesia was under the Dutch. Malaysia was under the British. Nigeria was under the British. Mozambique, a Muslim country, Mozambique, was by the Portuguese. It's a Muslim country, do you know that? Even today, 60% of the people are Muslims. You see, when the Portuguese took over with the superior gunpowder, the white man is very ingenious. The Chinese were playing with this sulfur, playing fireworks. The white man, when he came across that, he turned it into a devilish thing. He used it as gunpowder. And he knocked hells into everybody. He robbed my people in my country, he robbed them. India, 150 years they ruled us. They ruled about 150 years in Malaysia, 300 years in Indonesia, 500 years in Mozambique. It was a Muslim country. The governor was Musa bin Baik. An Arab governor, Musa bin Baik. The Portuguese couldn't say Musa bin Baik, so it's a Mozambique. <laughs> it was our land. These Westerners can't say Jabal Uttarik, so it's a Gibraltar. Gibraltar is a Muslim. Jabal Uttarik, the man who crossed into Spain from Africa, Muslim, the first Muslim conqueror of, of Spain, his name was Jabal, this is Tariq. So Jabal means a mountain of Tariq. So they can't say Jabal Tariq, they say Jabal Alta. Ma'amanillah, Ma'amanullah. They can't say Ma'amanullah, they say Manila. Muslim names. So, he said, is there any man greater than he? And the answer is in the question, no man greater than Muhammad. The greatest man that ever lived is Muhammad. Who bribed him? I said, you tell me, who bribed him? Which Arab? But prejudices die hard, very hard, prejudices die hard. Now this is with regards to the testimonies and tributes paid by worldly men. Now let us seek another standard, a religious standard. And who can we find better than Jesus Christ to give us a standard of judging? Let's go to Jesus. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 5, verse 36. Those of you who have Bibles, open them and check it out. John, chapter 5, verse 36. Jesus Christ is speaking about greatness. He's comparing himself with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, we call him Yahya alayhi salam. 
And about Yahya alayhi salam, Jesus had made certain statements, very flattering statements he had made about Yahya, John the Baptist. He, he, had, he had said, among those born of women, there has not been another greater than John the Baptist. The greatest man that ever lived among the Jews, the prophets, was John the Baptist, Jesus said. But now, he says, that he is greater than John. Among those born of women, the greatest man was John the Baptist, Yahya Ali That's his testimony. He had performed no miracles, remember, not one. But according to Jesus, the greatest man among the Jews, Jewish prophets, greater than Moses, David, Solomon, Ezekiel, Elijah, a whole lot put together, John the Baptist, according to Jesus. Now he says, John 536. He said, My witness, my shahada is greater than that of John, John the Baptist, not his disciple. He had a disciple called John. He had another disciple called John. He had a number of disciples. These were very common names. Jesus was a common name. John was a common name among the Jews. Like Tom, Dick, and Harry among us today. Or we had Muhammad, Ahmad, and Suleiman, and Dawood. Same. They were Jesus's by their tongues, and they're John's by their tongues. But he's talking about Yahya, alayhi salam, John the Baptist. He said, my witness is greater than John. For the works the Father has given me to finish, for that reason. What God wanted him to do, that work is greater than what John was supposed to do. John, Yahya alayhi salam, was only to prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. He was the forerunner of Jesus. So as that, hmm, he's very great. But now I am greater than him. Why? Because the work that God has given me to finish. So the standard of judging is, what work are you out to do? What is your mission in life? That shows how great one is, comparing one with the other, according to the standard given by Jesus Christ. Well, we know about his mission. He came, as I was telling you all last night, he came only for the Jews, only for the Jews. Again and again, he said, I'm not sent, but under the lordship of the house of Israel. He is telling his disciples, go ye not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But go ye rather unto the lordship of the house of Israel, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, that he had chosen one little tribe out of the thousands of tribes of the world. One little community, the children of Israel, and the lordship he was looking for. That was his job, and that makes him greater than John. And in John chapter 17, verse 3 and 4, he finished his mission. That's what he says. I want the Christians to come and tell me whether finish means finish. First is for what the Father had given me to finish. Now, he tells us in John 17, verses 3 and 4, that he finished the job long before his alleged crucifixion, long before. When there was nothing about the crucifixion, he said his job is finished. Listen, and this is life eternal, Jesus says, and this is life eternal, that they should know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This is like saying, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Isa Rasulullah. This is it. This is life eternal. If you accept that, Salvation is yours. That's what he says. And in the Holy Quran we are told, Pull, tell them, Ya Ahlul Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, La taghlu fi dinikum. Do not go to extremes in your religion. Don't go to extremes. They are going to extremes. Jesus Christ was born miraculously. So one group of people, the Jews, they insinuate that he is the illegitimate son of Mary because he's got no father. One extreme. The Christian says, because he's got no earthly father, his father is God. Another extreme. So Allah tells us to tell them. You're not doing the job. Allah is, you, bacha the Quran, you're repeating it how many times? Ya ahl al-kitab, la taghlu fi dinikum, wa la taqulu ala Allah illa al-haq. And don't say anything about Allah except the truth. Inna mal masih, most certainly the Messiah. Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah is the messenger of Allah. Wa kalimatuhu, and a word proceeding from him, Al-Qaha ila Maryam wa ruhum minhum, which he bestowed upon Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. 
فآمنوا بالله ورسله so believe in Allah and his messenger Jesus Christ what did Jesus say and this is life eternal that they should know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent do you believe that if you don't you're not a Muslim we believe that there is but one Allah and Hazrat Isa al -Islam was his messenger so from what Jesus said you have life eternal you don't have to worry you don't want expect anybody to be killed for you now no kurbani required of Jesus or anybody else no kurbani no sacrifice this is what he says unless he's speaking with a tongue in his cheek you know tongue in his cheek means means you say something but you mean something else you don't expect Jesus Christ to do that playing tricks upon his hearers his listeners and this is life eternal that they should know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent next verse now he looks up towards heaven he says I have glorified thee telling Allah I have glorified thee I have praised you on the earth I have finished I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do I have finished it job is done there's no crucifixion in sight nowhere he says I finished the job now oh Lord you know glorify me as I glorified you give me my reward my pay when you say you finished the job your boss gave you a job to do and you completed your toho whatever it is you took a little job whether plumbing electrician carpentry bricklaying whatever and now you said you what job you gave me I finished where's my pay I want my pay so he's asking for his pay did he finish the job he says he finished it and what was the job glorifying God and telling them that he is a messenger of God that's all that's the mission I want somebody to come and tell me that he didn't finish a job I want somebody to tell me that Jesus was not speaking the truth I want them to come forward and tell me the man said I finished the job give me my pay he's asking Allah for pay as I glorified you, now you have me also glorified, praised. You tell me, no, he didn't finish it. I want to hear that. Now the ministry of Jesus was limited. He came to reform the Jews. He came to reform them, take them out of the formalism, ceremonialism, going for the letter of the law, forgetting the spirit. And this is the whole teaching. Again and again, he's condemning the Jews. He's explaining to them, it's not this, but that. He said, it has been said by them of old time. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil. He who strikes you on the right cheek, give him the other. If a man takes away your coat, give him your cloak also. If a fellow makes, fellow makes you to walk one mile, walk with him too. He said, agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art with him on the way before he takes you before the magistrate and makes you to part with your last farthing. Good advice that. Don't go to court. It's a good advice, I tell you. But this is his teaching. This is what he came to do. He said, you, when you fast, don't fast as the hypocrites do, but fast like this. When you give charity, don't make a noise. Don't broadcast it. What your right hand gives, the left hand must know. That's not Islam. That's only half. And I have an opportunity to explain to you. This is only half of Islam. But for their needs, it was perfect. For the sickness of the Jews, this was perfect. When he comes, he is told in the verse that we started with, We have not sent you, don't make a mistake. This was towards the end of his earthly sojourn. Arabia was at his feet. He could afford now to sit back and relax. After 60 years of trials and tribulation, he can now sit back and relax. It was only a question of polishing up the ummah. That's all. Job was done. Not for him. Allah sends his messenger Jibreel, tells him, Wamar sanlaka illa ka fatalin nasi. He said, We have not sent you, but as a mercy unto the whole of mankind. Bashiram, as a giver of glad tidings, wanaziram, and as a warner. But the majority of mankind, the bulk of mankind, still don't know. As the Muslim Arab Urdu poet would say, Wakta fursat hai kaha, kama bi baki hai, nuri tohid ka itmama bi baki hai. There is no time for leisure. There's work to be done. The banner of Tawheed is to be lifted up. There's no time for leisure. What does he do? What did he do? Immediately he called the scribes. Those who could write. 
says, bring out your parchments and write what? Letters to the Emperor of Persia. To the Emperor of Persia. To the Emperor at Constantinople. Heracles at Constantinople. To the King of Egypt, the King of Yemen and the Nagas of Abyssinia. Five letters. He had them dictated. And five horsemen, ashabas. A horse, an ashaba, a companion, and a scroll. Thousand miles this way, one thousand five hundred miles this way, a thousand miles across the Red Sea, and on and on. Five people he sent them out in his lifetime. This is the example he set for us. This is the example he set for us. If he had our petrodollars, and if he had the printing machines that we have at our disposal, wouldn't he have flooded the world with the Quran? I ask you. One man, invaluable as half. One horse, invaluable animal. One horse, one man, and one scroll. One scroll. I saw this scroll. Scroll like this. Brownish, like thin plywood. I saw it in the Topkapi Museum in Istanbul. It's almost falling to pieces. We can't read it because it, the writings are scratchy. You know, we are used to nice, bold hand, round hand writing. Like this one of Yusuf Ali. You know, nice, bold hand writing. It's easy for us with the Fatha, Kasara, Dhamma, you know, the vowel points. But the Arabs didn't write the vowel points. They understood their own language. They wrote without the vowels. Zabar, Zer, Pesh. You know, we say Dhamma, Fatha, Kasara. They didn't write that. So it's hard for us to read. But side by side, they have got a transcript in ordinary Arabic. The Arabic that we read. And you can read, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. From Muhammad Rasulullah to Heracles, the emperor at Constantinople. I invite you to the religion of God. Accept it, accept it and be benefited. Then another verse from the Quran. Qul ya ahl al-kitab. Say, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, ta'ala, come. Ila kalimatin sawaim baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. An la na'buda illa Allah. That we worship none but Allah. Wa la nushrika bihi shayan. And that we associate no partners with him. And that we do not take from among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. But if they turn back, tell them that we at least are Muslims. We have submitted our will to the will of God. We have submitted our will to the will of God. This is the example he set us. Immediately he set in motion a process of delivering the message to all the whole known world around him. Messages were sent out in his lifetime. This is the example. You look at the life of Jesus. In his lifetime he never preached to a single known Jew. He never converted a single known Jew. Among the 12 disciples of his, not one was a known Jew. The disciples of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Salman Farsi the Persian was there, Bilal the Abyssinian was there. Besides the Quraysh. This is the life example. His territory is the world. The whole of mankind. But the bulk of mankind still do not know. That was then, 1400 years ago. Is it any different now? We are thousand million today, yes. But the bulk of mankind. Have they received that message yet? I ask you. There are more worshippers of men and monkeys, elephants and snakes on God's good earth today than the worshippers of the one true God. Do you know that? There are more mankind today worshipping men and monkeys, women, elephants, cows and what and what not, and humankind, and worshipping the devil. They have a Satan worshipping cult, worshipping shaitan. They go out of the way and say, we worship shaitan, the devil. They worship Sun Myung Moon, the Korean, in America. They're worshipping him as a god. Guru Maharaj Ji, they're worshipping as a god. Swami Prabhupada of the Hare Krishna movement, they're worshipping as a god. Sai Baba, they're worshipping as a god. Today, after 1,400 years of Islam, the situation is no better. It's a shame on us. Wallah, it's a shame. Absolute disgrace. 1,400 years, Allah is crying there. Say, Walakin Naksaran Nasi Layalamun. We are uttering the word, Walakin Naksaran Nasi Layalamun. But the bulk of mankind still don't know. But the bulk of mankind still don't know. What are we doing to rectify the situation? Nothing. We sit tight on our backside, satisfied. We go and make salat on Fridays, and inshallah, we'll go to Jannah. Inshallah, we'll go to Jannah. But Jannah is not that cheap. 
where we made it very cheap. The examples of the prophets. They sacrificed their all. You know at the Hajjatul Vida, the Fervil pilgrimage, there were about 110,000, 110,000 Ashabas at the Hajjatul Vida, the last Hajj that our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he performed. During the course of that sermon of his, he's telling them, he says, this message that I have given you, he said, have you received the message? And they all exclaim with one accord, most certainly thou hast. So he lifts up his eyes towards heaven. He says, Ya Bari Thala, O my Lord, be a witness that I have delivered my message. And now you that are present here, deliver it to those who are absent. And out of the 110,000 Asabas that were there, not even 10,000 are buried in Arabia. What, were they taken up, away into heaven in a flying saucer? No. They spread out throughout the world. They understood the message that this was not for home consumption only for themselves. This was not an Arab religion. This is the religion of God for mankind. And they spread out and they, send, they traveled as far as Indonesia, Malaysia, and they converted our people. They came to part, my part of India, they converted my people. They came as far as Nigeria, they converted the people. They came as far as Mozambique and they converted the people. They did the job. We now comfortably set. Alhamdulillah, we have done well. But this primary duty of the Muslim, we are not making any exertion to share this deen. And our survival, our salvation here and in the hereafter lies in this, that we share this deen. For survival, we have to share. It is the best insurance policy that we can ever take out, is to propagate the faith. Change the environment. Otherwise, the environment is going to change us, and it is changing us. They are forcing pig down our throat, wherever, any excuse. Pig, pig, you go into the airways, the pig is there right in front of you. Our forefathers, they held on to certain small principles and the reward that Allah gave us, just little things. Meat, they said, no, we want halal meat. Halal meat. Just, and, and we are a handful of people. We are less than 2% of the whole South African population. Less than 2%. And when we started, we were abject, in abject poverty. Our, our forefathers here were as slaves to the white man. My people, we are also, also living on the smell of an oil rag, as the white man was describing, on starvation level. In 1927, when I came from India, at the age of nine, we were living on a starvation level. As the white man sarcastically said, the Indian is living on the smell of an oil rag. <laughs> it's only the smell that's keeping him alive, I mean starvation. And we were starving. Now, Allah has blessed us. From that to this, where we have reached, shouldn't we open our mouths? Allah has given us a deen, a way of life which you don't have to be ashamed of anything. There is not another nation or community that can teach you anything. There is no religious group on earth that can teach you anything in hygiene. We are the most hygienic people. We are the most hospitable people. In brotherhood, in piety, in charity, in sobriety, there's not another nation that can show a candle to us. And yet we don't get converts. The Christian with all his arrogance, he's getting converts. He's getting converts. We don't get converts. I want to know why. Is Islam a spent force? Is the Quran now to be put in a museum, a museum piece? Is that what you think? No. The reason is very simple. We don't open our mouths. That's all. You must op learn to open your mouth. Talk, man, talk. Can't you say something about Islam? Don't you know one thing about Islam? That's all. One thing. Can't you talk about one thing, about your hygiene? Why don't you tell him about your hygiene? How hygienic we are, the amount of water that we use. Number one, we wash. When you go for number one, we wash. Number two, we wash. Any excuse, water, water, water. We, are, we use more water than any other people on earth. Use, not abuse. Why don't you speak about it? Tell them. You know, I was supposed to have one of my new brothers in faith, an Englishman, Mr. James Cunningham. He is now Jamaluddin Cunningham. He was bringing these books to give to any of our city hall meeting, 3,000. Uh, it was quite a heavy load in the car. He reached as far as Naishna, and somehow the car skidded, and uh, it's a total wreck. This morning he left back for home, and the books are coming by some private company. Cross, was it? Cape, hmm? Cape Cross Express, something like that. 
Flaskape Express. This young man, Englishman, his father and mother are Roman Catholics. And he's got a can in the toilet. Look, you know, beautiful things you can learn from innocent, like little children. He has a can in the toilet. The parents didn't like his conversion. He said, you can be anything. If you don't believe in God, it's all right. You become Hare Krishna, it's all right. But Muslim is the red rag to the bull. Because now he's going to say, drinking is bad, daddy. Gambling is wrong, daddy. See, everywhere. So dancing is dead, baby, daddy. So everywhere now, this Muslim, his son is a Muslim, is going to come in the way. So he hates this young fellow, but somehow things are cooling off. But now, always, what are you doing with that can in the toilet, James? So he explained it. Again, he says, James, what are you doing with that can in the toilet? So he says, Daddy, look. He says, you know, you, to wash that pan with heartpick and whatnot, 20 liters down the drain to wash the pan, but not one drop for yourself. On yourself, not one drop. <laughs> Look, it's a fent. He said, not one drop you use for yourself. For the pan, what would you do? Huh? That brush and that harpy and what and what not, you know? Killing all the germs, yes. But you carry it on yourself. I said, Daddy, not one drop for yourself. So the old man goes and tells his wife. He says, you know, James has got a point there, but I won't admit it. <laughs> this is man. This is man. I said, look. Isn't there anything you can talk about? Nothing. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he gave us the secret of knowledge. He said, "Balligo anni walaukana ayah." Deliver the message regarding me, even if it is one verse, one fact. Give it one fact. Give it. Talk about it. One thing about this. What I told you now. I said, "Look, you know this English man. He is converted, and his father is always wanting to know what he is doing with a can in the toilet. Can in the toilet." So this young man, I don't know how it came to him, he said, look, daddy, he says, you know, for the can, 10 liters, 20 liters down the drain to wash the can, pot, the pan. Nothing for yourself, daddy. You don't put one drop on yourself. <laughs> so he said, but he says, I won't admit it. He's telling his wife, he says, I don't, I won't admit it. I know he's got a point there, but I won't admit it. But you can do the same. Look, there's something that you can share. May Allah Baritala give us that tawfiq, that hidayat. And once you start doing that, Allah will fill you with knowledge. Knowledge only comes by use. You listen to me, you are being entertained, I know. You like to listen to me. And you go home and finish. Till I come back again, maybe, if I'm alive. But now, look, what little you learn, one fact. Just use that. Use that. You'll be able to get the tapes, cassette tapes, from Mr. Muhammad in a week's time or so, all these lectures. Then we are making videos of this. You'll get video tapes. And maybe from tomorrow night, some of the videos that the young man was bringing will be on sale. On SABC TV, the program, we had the debate, plus other, so many other things there. You buy that tape. We, we are not out to do business. Wallah, you, you, when, you, when you listen to me, you'll know that this guy is not a businessman. He'll go bankrupt. I know I won't go bankrupt. I'm de dealing business with him, you see. And with him, you can't go bankrupt. I said, look, my dear brothers and sisters, if you have a video machine, you buy one video tape, 25 rands. This also, 25 rands. Is the cheapest videotape you can buy of a program, 25 rands. And a money back guarantee. You keep it for 30 days. You see it, you make copies if you like, and return it to us. Your money be, will be refunded in full, 100%. You give us 25 rands, we'll give you 25 rands back. That means it doesn't cost you a cent. Keep it for a month, see it, return it to us, and get your money back. <laughs> Have you ever come across business people like that? Huh? But I know. I'm doing business with him. It works. It'll work. It'll work. It is working. So here is an offer. Get the tape. See it. Show it to your friends. Call them. Say, look, man, let's come for a cup of tea. And says, put it on. So if you let, let the people see and then talk about what you see. What do you think? You know, does it make sense? So it's an indirect way of entertaining the fellow, giving him tea, and brainwashing him. Why not? The whole world is trying to brainwash us. Why shouldn't we brainwash other people? Because if we don't, we are getting brainwashed in any case. May Allah Baritala, Mr. Chairman, and my brothers and sisters, I've taken so much of your time. May Allah Baritala, you know, give me the health that I may come back to you again and share more with you. And may He give you that hidayat that what little you hear from me, you might be able to pass it on to our brothers and sisters. Wa akhiru dawan and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Thank you, Brother Didat. Before we 
put the evening open to question time, I would like to bring a few points home. At the lectures which are to follow on this one, at the other centers, it's listed on the back of this pamphlet. Please ask your friends to come. Come yourself and bring your neighbors. Send the pamphlet around to friends. Please do not forget that you are allowed to bring cassette recorders and video cameras if you have these equipment. Please don't forget that you must make your evening memorable. Come and purchase two Qurans by Allama Abdullah Yusuf Ali, 10 rands for two, instead of 15 rands for two. If you buy one, tonight it's 7.50. There ain't many left tonight. Last night, I bought two, and there was such a scramble for it. Somebody said, man, you are going every night, can't you give it to me? So I sold mine, didn't make a profit. Then tonight, I made sure that I bought my two first. The tapes, the cassette tapes of this series of lectures, as soon as it's being finished, ordinary cassettes will be finished and available somewhere in early next week, Tuesday. The video cassettes of the series will be available in plus minus three weeks' time. And as the price was quoted, 25 rand a tape. Money back guarantee. Money back guarantee. I think we should say the same for this too. Uh, when it comes to question time, I would like to put or to remind some people that first of all, if you want to put a question, I think it is common courtesy that you are fair to the lecturer. These lectures were well advertised. The topic of tonight, that's why I made such a big spiel of telling you what's coming tomorrow night. So that if you want to put the question, make research of your own and come and put the question on the topic. The lecturer has prepared himself for tonight. Please put questions relating to tonight's topic. I think that's fair and that's courtesy. Also, if you put a question, if you want to ask a question, come up to the microphone in front. As many of you as you like, it's common courtesy to form a queue. We've had nice queues over the previous evenings. And I think we had people who put their questions in a delightful manner. I would like those people who have no questions to ask. And there are some of us, I don't blame you, there are some of us who've come perhaps just for the entertainment. We welcome you also. But if you've come for the entertainment, there are some people, if you bear in mind that the topics that are being dealt with are very sensitive topics. The topics that are being dealt with deals with the beliefs of people. We're not here to slander anybody. And if a man has grown up as a Christian, and if he holds the Bible sacred, then give him the respect that is due to him. He has got a right to put his question. Please do not try to heckle him, and please do not laugh at him if he puts a question. When you put a question in front of an audience, you may never have had the opportunity before. It may not be easy. You are nervous. You probably even get tongue-tied. Give the man a fair chance and do not heckle him. Likewise, I ask the questioners, give the lecturer a fair, time, fair chance to answer. Put one question at a time. Please do not try to give a sermon if you wish to. I'm sure you can ask the people, the hall is available for hire. Please do your own hiring of the hall, and I'm not saying this in a sarcastic manner. But do not come to try to give a lecture because I will be compelled to stop you. And I wouldn't like to stop you. Also, if you have more than one question, ask one, and then go to the back of the queue. Give all the brethren in the queue the chance to ask a question. We obviously will have to stop at some time, so put, make your question brief. And please respect the chair. If I ask you to go and sit down, then you must know that I have come to the end. I cannot really entertain you any further. You are now free to come to the microphone. Anybody who wishes to ask a question pertaining to the topic as dealt with tonight. Thank you.
microphone is in front. Eh? Um, Mr. Didat, good evening, gents. Um, I know that the Arabs and the Muslim, they are the richest. But just one thing, Moses in the Torah, weren't Moses to say for a fact, didn't Moses deny the things of Pharaoh? Because he grew up, as I will say that, he grew up in the palace of Pharaoh, Moses. As you know, you have studied the Bible and the Torah. Now, Moses rejected the things of Pharaoh to lead rather the Egyptians. It was in afflictions out of Egypt. What do you say according to your, the rich Arabs, and to the poor Jewish people, and Muhammad, and Moses? I, I, I never understood the question at all. Could you just, could I just get you a brief question? Sum it up in a nutshell. We don't want to give you a wrong answer. I haven't understood your question at all, my son. Will you please? I don't know what the question is. I don't know whether you people have understood. Just the main part of the article. What question. is the question? The question is, what do you say is about this? Moses grew up in Pharaoh's palace, to grow up in a palace is something different. To grow up in the state where you are in affliction, affliction. And can say, for instance, Muhammad didn't any, I won't say that Muhammad grew up with affliction. And I'll say that Muhammad also, because he married a rich, as you have said it, he married a rich woman. I don't know if she was a widow or anything, but the thing is that I want to know, why do you say, because you say Muhammad the greatest? Moses denied the riches of Pharaoh. Yeah, I... Christ denied the riches of the earth while the devil was entertaining him the world's kingdom. What do you say in conferring to that of Christ, Muhammad, and Moses? Thank you. It looks like the young man has got me into knots. Uncle, I think he's trying to say, if you say Muhammad is great, and to clarify your point and to substantiate it, you're saying uh, Muhammad وسلم, lived under poor conditions and denied himself the riches. Uh, didn't Moses do the same? Or I never he? made any such statement. You see, now there it is. The man is putting words into my mouth which I never uttered. I don't know what to answer him. I didn't say any such things. I said, look, this man, uh, La Martin, if you heard me correctly, he says, greatness of purpose, what the man is out to do. These are his standards. I, I didn't give you these things. These are the Westerner, La Martin, a Frenchman, he's talking about greatness of Muhammad. The greatest man that ever lived, he says, is Muhammad. And the standards he gives, not me, he said, greatness of purpose, smallness of means. What he's thinking about? This child, before he's born, his father dies. Often. By the time he's six, he's doubly often. Is that an asset or a liability? Being born in the home of a pharaoh is an asset. This man is born with liabilities after liabilities. Can you see? Jesus Christ was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was one of the richest of persons. The disciples were following him because he was able to feed them. They didn't pay for it. You know that Last Supper, you remember? He said, look, go to a certain place. You'll find a mansion there. Find the water, the water carrier, follow him. And you go there and tell them that the master has sent that we must prepare for the feast of the Passover. Everything was found. The lamb was found. The wine was there. They enjoyed themselves. Go to another place and you'll find a, a colt and a donkey. Go and bring them. You remember? Look, the man is rich. This man, Muhammad, starts doubly often by the time he's six. Another year or so, his grandfather dies. Now his uncle Abu Talib looks after him, looking after his sheep and goats. Smallness of means. No political party. No organized church. Nothing. They were not looking for a liberator, the Arabs. Moses, the, his people were grating under the, Rome, the Egyptian yoke. They want somebody to liberate them. Jesus, when he came, the people were waiting for the Messiah. It's easy. Now, if people are waiting for you, it's easy to prove your 
your authority, your bona fide. He just goes and said, look, you, the man you're waiting for, it's me. This man, Muhammad, then he comes, nobody's waiting for him. Everything is going against him. He says, there is one God, they had the 360 around the Kaaba. He says, no drink, they were all drunkards. He says, no drink, they were gamblers, he says, no gambling. Look, the greatest controversialist that ever lived was Muhammad. Everything he said is going against the grain. Whatever they're doing, he says, no. They had unlimited number of wives, he restricted them. Slaves, he said, feed them with what you eat and clothe them with, with, with what you wear. And if they make a mistake, you are not in time to forgive, give them the freedom. At every step, what he starts with. And the achievement. The results. Look at the results. 1,000 million started how? Moses had a good start. You know, they robbed the Egyptians of all the gold, you remember? The, all the jewelry, they made the golden calf out of what? Out of their gold? No. The Egyptians gold they stole. See, they had a good start. Jesus had a good start, a mighty good start. Muhammad, this is how he became. So, I didn't say that, I'm only quoting. Now, if you think that La Martin is exaggerating, then you must prove to the contrary. You must prove to the contrary that this man is exaggerating. Is there another question now? Good evening, Mr. Leader. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very thankful for this talk tonight, and I think, you know, I agree with you in many points, particular that Muhammad is definitely a very great leader of his people, and he's there. he has done many... Lift the mic up. Sorry. He has done many positive things, I think, for his people, for the Arabic, Arabic people. And I think in very many respects, Muhammad is a person who has brought... Uh, even in our days, perhaps, or he, is, he can be called, even in our days, one of the greatest people. I must admit to this point. But I think there's one question, I think, which is on my mind. Uh, I think we all admit that the Rolls Royce is the best car. Now, maybe some people, they will say it's a Mercedes. But yet, although the Rolls Royce is the best car, it cannot fly. It cannot fly. So I think our, the question must be, according to which then standard, is Muhammad the greatest? What is the standard? Now you ask the question in your talk, what was the mission of Christ? Now the mission of Christ was clearly said in the, in the gospel, you read it in all the gospels in the beginning. The mission of Christ was that he is a lamb of God who takes away the sin of mankind. In other words, the whole mission and the purpose of Christ was to bring man into unity with God. Sorry, now, uh, can you put the question? Yes, now I'm, I'm actually, you know, answering his question. He brought the question, I would like to answer his question here, and I'm coming finally to my question. And um, secondly, you quoted John 17, verse 1 and verse 4, and there it says, you know, Jesus did not say this particular question, passage. You know, we must put these things right. He doesn't say, it is finished there. He says, the time has come to glorify me, to glorify your son. Now, that was the beginning of this, uh, the crucifixion or the being uh, taken prisoner and then being crucified. And then we read in verse 4 what you quoted, those people have got eternal life who believe and know God and Jesus Christ, his son. And then two chapters later only, when he was caught and so on, and when he was on the cross, he said the words, it is finished. In other words, he said, I have accomplished the task for which I have come. Now, the question, who is the greatest? Christ came to give us life eternal. Muhammad came to do many things, to deal with practical matters like you, how to use a toilet and other things. But the greatest question is, I think, and the greatest purpose is, how, how do you and I get reconciled with God? How do I have eternal life? You haven't answered this question. You mentioned many things on a social, historical, political, military, as expect, but the standard of God and the question of God is, how can I attain peace with God? Jesus gave the perfect answer. So Jesus is the greatest on this particular standard. What yeah. is your answer to Could that? May I have your book open as it is? Yes. I want to read that verse in your Bible. The one you say, John chapter 17, 3 and 4. What does it say there? Could you, could you get to the microphone? I'll bring it Bible to you. Now, 
This is eternal life. I read it, this is life eternal, same thing. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Word for word, it's choice of words, same meaning. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Completing the work in the authorized King James Version, it says, I have finished. This is the new international version of mm -hmm. yours. Mm -hmm. The King James Version says, I have finished the work that you have given me to do. Now, do you take exception to that translation? And I think you must be very clear here. As you, you must see the... No, the Bible. word finished. Yes. The word I got is not from... This is the King James Version of the mm -hmm. Bible, mm -hmm. which is the Bible used by pre predominantly the whole Christian world. This new international version of yours is something novel to the bulk of mankind. No, no. To the bulk, I said, to the bulk no. of Christendom. No. Look, as against the King no. James Version, mm -hmm. this is the Bible that is translated into other languages. This one, not no. that. No. The new international version has been translated from the original text of Hebrew and Greek. What, what? Not from the King no, James no, what, Version. What year was this first printed? Not uh, very recently, but tell, according tell to the no, 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 just, just, just tell me when was this printed? I think it was in 81. 1981? I think it was 81. Right, that's three years ago. This one was first published in 1611. Yes. yes. Right? And right. this was the only Bible available up to almost yesterday. No. Before you I had the almost, letter... Please, please. I understand my simple language. I said, this was the only Bible. Look, when I was a young man, there was no other Bible that you could buy. But can we come back to the topic, Mr. Didat? We are right. diverting from the topic now. We're talking about the Bible, not on the text. No, the, the text, text is I, who is the greatest? I am talking, number one, you are deceiving the people by quoting something from a new Bible. No. When, look, you must tell me now that this Bible is rubbish. I should throw this away. You must tell me that. And you must tell all the Christians that DRC, they follow this. The, 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 the Zulus, they follow this, the Chwanas, everybody. In Arabic, this is the only Bible available. In, in yes. Urdu, this is the only Bible available. Now, if Jesus said it is finished, that my work is finished, now does finish means finish? Will you have a look at it? Jesus says here very clearly, and you see the talk, see please, people, see the context. And this is life eternal, life eternal. He came to give life eternal. That they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And I have glorified thee on earth, he on earth. Glorified God. He glorified God on right? earth. Thee, of course, yeah, God. Yeah. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to I do. I have finished. Right? Let me just carry on. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So here you see already Christ has finished so far his job on earth. On no, earth. Not but so far. Shh, that so far, don't put your words inside the Bible. Does it say so far? Please read the Mr. Bible. Mr. Dida, does Keep the Bible stop here? Does the word of God stop here? Now that's finished. What about the two chapters later on where it says in the same Bible like right, yours? Right. May I just quote yes, this in yes. your Bible? You, yes, you go, have ahead. Here. go ahead. Where Jesus Christ says, says clearly on the cross, when they, when they crucified him and two others with him, on either side, one, and Jesus in the midst, Pilate wrote the title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now let me just find the other portion where it says here, it is finished. A little bit later, I marked it in my Bible, it's easy to find. Let me explain to my brethren here. You see, this word finished in John chapter yeah, 17, in 13, chapter 17, it says finished. Again, the same word finished is used later on maybe after a year maybe after six months maybe after six weeks same word finished is used now the translators of this bible they can see that you can't have two times you say finished so they change the word 
Look, this is how the tricks that they have been playing. It's going on, this game is going on eternally. Never. As soon as it doesn't suit them, look, the word there is finished, the other place it says it is finished. So you can't have finished the job twice to get your pay. When you finished it, you get your pay. You can finish one job, uh, one half no, job, but that's, money. If he said the job, the whole job that God had given him, for you granted him authority over all people. Now this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God. Not Jesus Christ. You, you. In, 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 in the old English is the singular, the only true God. And Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work. I said, look, by finishing the work, what is, what is the difference between completing and finishing? But now, the trick is that the, if you use the word finish, as the, author, as the writers of the King James Version had done, and you use again, he's finished, he said, but he had already finished the job. Didn't he get his pay? Now, that other finish, you see, is a man saying, I am dead. Look, that finished job is that he's dead, I'm dying. This is what he's talking about. It is finished with me. You know, something comes along like that young man, he came along with those questions and it seemed it was finished with me. Am I right? In other words, I couldn't understand. I couldn't grasp it. What am I going to tell him? You know, the whole thing is like a confusion, like a riddle, like a conundrum. So it was finished with me. Now what finished? That means I was dead? No. In other words, you feel, man, that you are helpless. Jesus Christ same. He says, it is, if he said those words, Number one, we contest the words, but the words are in your Bible, in that Bible. I'm consistent. I'm not using one from here and one from there. Right. Here he says finished. Either when he said finished, he meant finished or he was deceiving. He wasn't speaking the truth. He's telling God, I finished the job and now do your job. Did you forget that Jesus said, when he used the word, I have finished the work which thou gavest to me. Right. That Jesus prayed to the Father and he says, no, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self was the glory which I had with thee before the world was. In other words, here Jesus Christ says, the work of God continues in his life. Christ said, you have to resurrect me. He speaks here already. He was ready to do the will of God perfectly to the end. And the glorification of Jesus Christ took place when Jesus Christ was risen and he was alive. And you proclaim that forgiveness of sins that, has been that granted. Is the subject, so he is the greatest. That greatest. is the subject we are discussing on Saturday in but the city hall. My question was, my final question is on this point. No, no, Isn't Jesus Christ the greatest because he gives eternal life? He says, he said himself that there is somebody coming after me. No. No, now you say no. You say, now you say it's the Holy Spirit. Now this is what it means now you want to debate with me. And if you want to debate with me, the privilege is yours. You see, if you want to debate any subject, all that I've been dealing with so far, all the subjects in the future, it would be your privilege, your privilege, I'll gi I'm giving you, look at me, look at me, look at me, I'm giving you the privilege of organizing a meeting, you organize a meeting here in Cape Town on any subject, whether on the crucifixion, whether Jesus is God, whether the spirit of truth is Muhammad or the Holy Ghost, anything, you organize the meeting and we, I will come along and address that meeting. Then you can, we can have a debate. But here is now question time, and I say, finished is finished. When the man said he finished it, and he's asking his reward, right? So unless, again, he's speaking with a tongue in his cheek. How? Oh. Next Mr. question. Mr. Dida, I fully agree, I know there's finish, but finish can be used in two words. Finish, when I, in this explanation, when I have painted the house or anything, I'm not a painter. When I have painted the house and I say, I'm finished, I mean I've finished painting the house. When I'm in a boxing ring and I've dead oh knocked me down, it's finished with me. When Christ said it's finished, he means that he was dead. He was away and that's the meaning. But what do you say about this, Mr. Ahmadida? According to Exodus, right? And Mr. Sir, I fully respect you, but never put words into your uncle's mouth because your uncle is an individual. I thank you, right. It says here, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am that I am sent you. 
Now Moses was sent. And I remember Monday night when you have said that Jesus Christ, it's all in my question. Then I'm bringing the point out, sir. Now I want to be briefly. Right. It's all this that Christ, he said that I'll rise up a prophet as like was unto you. I'll be a brother to put my mouth in, words into his mouth. He'll speak what it is. Right. I bring you, beg you on that path last night even, and you didn't answer me. You sat down. Now listen to this. Uh, we are waiting. I am come. Are you putting a question? Yeah, this is the question. Right. Now, that was Moses said that I am, God told Moses, I am that I am have sent thee. Now, Mr. Ahmad did that. I am, this is what Jesus is saying. I am come in my Father's name, and he received me not. If another shall come in his own name, him will you receive. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accused you, even Moses, in whom he trust. For had he believed Moses, you would have believed me. For right. he wrote of me. Now, Mr. Ahmadi, that the people, the Jews that time, didn't even believe Moses. So this is the fact why Christ came. And Mr. Didat, what do you say about these two things? When Christ said, I am come, and I have done what you have said. And Moses said, God told Moses, thus told him, I am have said thee. Right. I hope, uh, Mr. Didat, you've got the question. Uh, our, our, my son is all confused. You know, I don't know. The Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Ghost is letting him down left, right, and center. He started with the quotation from the book of Exodus, where Moses wants to know from God. God commands him, go along and liberate my people. So he wants to know, what shall I tell the people? Who sent you? Who sent me? So in Hebrew, the word, words are, you see, you don't know Hebrew. The thing is, you should bring your Dumini. You know your Dumini? The, you don't believe in Dumini? He doesn't believe in Dumini. So, yes. He's, what he sorry. says is... Is there another questioner to come up? Yeah. Yes, sorry. What he says is this, that tell the people, Eheye, Asher, Eheye. This is Hebrew. means I am that what I am. What you worried about my name? Go and tell them that I sent you. He didn't give his name. He will use the word which they have translated as I am. So now they want to say that Jesus is God because when they were looking for him, they said they're looking for Jesus. So he said, I am. So that means he's God. Because God said, I am. I said, look, you could be looking for Ahmad Didat. And you come to me, you say, you Ahmad Didat? I said, I am. Am I claiming divinity? I'm God. Because God says, I am an Allah. I am God. So he said, I am. So I also said, I am Didat. So I am means God. It's a funny kind of logic. You know, it's, it's, it, it, I said, look, bring your priest along. This guy, you know, who's supposed to have brainwashed you, programmed you. Bring that fellow here. It makes us easy to talk. But now, <laughs> I think our brethren are waiting with Thank that you. question. Thank you. There's another Let brother. Them have the would you come to the microphone, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Didat. I would like you to explain. Could you lift the microphone uh, up? Yeah. I would like you to explain to everybody what your idea of a Christian is. Because in your lecture, you referred to the Reverend Jim Jones implying that he was a reverend, implying that he was a Christian. When you refer to people of different uh, denominations, like the Anglican and the DRC and so on, you are implying to all these folk that they are Christians. But I just would like to tell you what a Christian is. A Christian is a person not in a denomination. Christian. Not necessarily in a denomination, let me put it to you that way. I would also like to tell you that the Christian of 1984 today condemns the deeds of the Reverend Jim Jones outright. And I would like to tell you that a Christian is one that's repented of their sins and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord and is making every effort to walk in His way and, empl uh, and employing His will in their lives. Sorry, can we, can we come back yes. to your question? Let's repeat your question. Yeah. No, no, I think I understood. Right. You see, the, the question was about who is a Christian. According to the definition given, 
It says the Christian is not supposed to belong to any denomination. That's our brother said, no denomination. So the Roman Catholics, numbering some 700 million among the, the so-called Christians now, he won't accept them. That means they are not Christians. The DRC belongs to a denomination. The Dutch Reformed Church, supposed to belong to a denomination. So they are not Christians. He said, if they don't belong to any denomination. The Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians. The Seventh-day Adventists are not Christians. The Christadelphians are not Christians. So I want to know, Lucy, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not that intolerant. If you tell me that you are a Christian, I accept you. Never mind what label you apply on yourself. Whatever label you give, it's not my business. You say you're a Christian, you accept this Bible as your book of authority, you said yes, I can talk to you. Whether you are a Jehovah's Witness, whether you are a Seventh-day Adventist, whether you are a Mormon, whatever you are, if you say you are a Christian, as far as I'm concerned, I will treat you as a Christian. Uh, may I answer you on this now? Not answer. I want you to now contradict me to say that these people, the Dutch Reformed Church, are not Christians. No, I did not. According to your definition. No, you're putting words in my mouth, sir. I said to you that a Christian does not necessarily belong to any denomination. But now I gave these, you, I've already given you my no, no, right. But, but you say now these, the, the Roman Catholics, are they Christians? A Roman Catholic who has committed his life to Jesus Christ and repented of his sins can be a Christian. I'm not here to condemn anybody. I'm here to say my definition of a Christian as the Bible uh, describes what a person must do to become a Christian. That is what the Jehovah's Witnesses say. No, that the, no, that's that not what they they say that you are not a Christian. They say you are a pagan. I'm not saying that. The Jehovah's Witness say you are a Trinitarian, and as such, you are a worshiper of three gods. Is, am I right? That's what the Jehovah's Witness say about well, you. I'm not here to answer for what the Jehovah's Witness is no, no, saying about me. No, but now look, me. they tell me that you are not a Christian. Am I to accept their words against yours? You must read the Bible and see what the Bible says about a Christian. But look, the Jehovah's Witness, they are very great readers of the Bible. They read the Bible more than any other sect or denomination. Yes, but which Bible do they read? A big Bible? They've printed their own Bible. Right. But right. I'm not here to discuss what the, uh, uh, so, I mean, the Jehovah's Witness So will you, will you not accept them as Christians? If a Jehovah's Witness comes to repentance and accepts Jesus Christ into his life, then he is a Christian. Well, that's what he claims. So if they claim what you are claiming for yourself. And that is my definition of a Christian. Right. To me, you say you are a Christian, I accept you. The other guy says he's a Christian. Whoever says he's a Christian, as far as I'm concerned, I'm there to, to deal with him. Mr. Ahmadi, that in your lecture you said that Paul is the most highest and Paul has written more epistles than anybody else in Christ now to say Christ had his followers, his apostles. Paul had his epistles, which was his letters and the gospel of St. John and St. Luke and St. Peter and all these guys were just their Gospels. But listen to this. I add it up together and I stick it. Here is it, Mr. Amadi, that how my many books are pulled out towards the Gospel of Christ. Right. The books according to Christ of his disciples yes. are 132 uh, verses and the Apostle Paul have about 95. Bro brother, sorry. According to Christ. Could I... I don't know what the question, could you just put the question to him first? I, Mr. Amadita, the question is this. In your lecture, you have said that Paul have more epistles, which means letters, written than any others that were of Christ. And Paul has written and has done more miraculous work than Christ. Hold it, hold it. Did I say he performed more miraculous work than Christ? Did Mar I say any such things? No. Then look. No. Oh, right. Now, right. I, I, uh, you know, look, please. No. Please leave it out, my son. Look, leave it out. Leave it out. He said, look, you and I, we are poles apart in our thinking and understanding. This language of English. Mm -hmm. You are telling me things that I never said. Sorry. That he performed more miracles than anybody else. Did I ever utter those words? Must it was not a part of the subject. Mr. Amma did that. When I say miracle, I don't mean I only actually make an explanation. Sorry, there's somebody but else there who's go got to put a question, right? Thank you. Sorry, but I just would like to justify one thing. 
um, you didn't say that he reheated more epistles or wrote more epistles, but I put it down here. You said grace, the teaching of grace is Pauline, not from the others. That's what you said. Is it correct? So, and I think uh, that is according to scripture, not correct. Because in 1 Peter, we read very clearly that Peter writes here in 1 Peter 1 verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into the living hope um, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, etc. Here very clearly in this whole passage, and I would like to encourage all the whole audience to read the letters of Peter, who was one of the closest of Jesus' followers, as well as the letters of John. And very clearly, you take the time tonight, very clearly you will find that grace is expounded there. Grace comes through Jesus Christ by faith which you put into it. It's not just Pauline. Just this, just, is, this is the trouble. You see, I said any time we have a, a conflict with our Christian brethren, it's either Paul, 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 now Peter. I want to know what does Jesus say? You see, this is the problem is, I said, look, Jesus says, I am talking about your Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, you listening, brother, you can't be listening while you're turning the pages, please. The human mind can't do two things at the same time. Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no heaven for you unless you are better than the Jew. And how can you be better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments? So now you say the law is nailed to the cross. I ask you, are you circumcised? You say, no. I'm talking about the generality of Christendom. Maybe for constriction or some other reason, sickness, you might have been circumcised. But as religiously, are you circumcised? I'm asking you, are you circumcised? I, I don't think you know I have to answer this question. Right, you. No, the thing is, you are not circumcised. <laughs> the Christian says he is not circumcised so because he is not bound by the law. He is not bound by the law. I say, where did you get that? So, he's going to quote Corinthians and Philippians and Galatians no. and Peter and James. I say, what does your Jesus say? Jesus says, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So, can't you see, we are at loggerheads because I am following Jesus, the master. Whatever the master says, we say we agree, we accept. Because the master was teaching nothing other than Islam, keep the laws and the commandments, believe in God. And this is what he told a Jew very beautifully. A learned man of the Jew comes to Jesus and he says, good master, what good thing must I do to gain eternal life? For Jannah, heaven, what must I do? So Jesus says, why callest thou me good? There is none good except one. That is God. He doesn't deserve to be called even good according to him. There is only one good, that is God. But, but, are you listening brother? But, if thou will enter into life, keep the commandments. Salvation comes by keeping the laws and the commandments. He says, he is not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. I want to know whether you are following him. Are you? Yes. You are. You eat the pig? You eat pigs? Yes. Right. Did Jesus eat the pig? No. no. He no. destroyed 2,000 pigs. But the Christian them, they are all pig eaters now. And you say you're following him. Jesus was circumcised. Was he? You follow him? Are you circumcised? He says no. You say you're following him. You see, you are accepting words with words. Mr. Didat, I, th I think we split hairs here. Jesus made wine. Do you drink wine? Jesus drank wine. Did you do you drink wine? There was no Listen, law. Mr. Didat, let's the, be fair. Let's be fair. We don't split. No, hands. no, you you Look, you are to follow him. Mr. Didat, I think we must be fair here. And I think time is running out. Time and is running now, out. You have very got a very good point when you say here, for I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds or surpasses that of the Pharisees, who were the most religious and the most sorrow people? The Pharisees, they said, you see, who those who keep the law to the dot, no one else. Like Mr. Didat, he is the most perfect Muslim perhaps in the country. But Jesus says, if you surpass your righteousness, you must surpass the righteousness. Where, how can you surpass the righteousness? The young man you quoted now, 
He said, keep the law. He said, the young man said, but I'm perfect. I'm like the Pharisees, I have kept everything. What did Jesus say? There is something in your heart which is not right. That's your wealth. And he said, sell this wealth and then, and come and follow me. That is to follow Jesus. How to become more than the Pharisees. How to, be, how to become righteous to follow Jesus. Thank you. Thank he, he explained to the Christians, his followers, how to be better than the Jew. He just didn't leave it in the air making beautiful statements. He said, when you fast, now his disciples, the Christians, if they are his followers, when you fast, do not fast as the hypocrites do. How you can be better than the Jew? The Jew was fasting, he was praying, he was giving charity, he was straight jacketing his life, but you are supposed to be better than that. Which way? Jesus explains. He said, when you fast, do not fast as the hypocrites do. They do not wash their faces and they don't brush their hair. Who the Jews? To be seen of men. In other words, with muck in their eyes. I think you better tell this young man to sit down, please. Yes, please. Just tell him to sit down. Please. We had enough of him already. Yeah. With muck in their eyes, you know, gloomy feeling. He said, what's wrong, uncle? So I said, I'm fasting. See, it leaves that impression that Mr. Didat is a very pious religious man. Out of season and in season is fasting. So he says, no, 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 you, when you fast, you must wash your face and brush your hair of a happy countenance. Nobody knows that you're fasting because you're fasting for the love of God. So you can be better than the Jew. By doing that, but on a higher level. The Jews, when they committed adultery, they were guilty. You, my followers, Jesus says, if the thought goes through your mind, whosoever Look at upon a woman to lust after her had committed adultery with her already in his heart. So no beauty contest for you, no long leg contest for you. This is what he means, better than the Jew. You keep the laws, but on a higher level. When you give charity, the Jews made a big noise. See, you know, so and so, his wife was in hospital, childbirth, and he couldn't bail her out. I had to help him with 250 rands. I tell the whole world, you know, I helped him. I helped him. Her brother, 250 rands I gave, so I'm boosting my ego at his expense. So Jesus says, no, when you give what your left hand gives, your right hand mustn't know. Can I see? So he's explaining to you every step how you can be better than the Jew, not by not keeping the laws and the commandments, but by keeping the laws and the commandments on a higher spiritual level, which the Christian is only accepting words by words. He says, you accept, you follow him? He says, I follow him. I said, which way are you following him? You don't look like him. You don't behave like him. You, your diet is not like his. In everything, he's just the opposite of what you have been doing. If he comes along in his second coming, I'm telling our Christian brethren, in the free state, and if they recognize him, what are they going to do with him? Take him home and a pig on the spit. They're going to praise it for him. He's going to vomit. Can you see? So in other words, look, he will be most uncomfortable with you, but if he comes to my house, any Muslim home, you know, my wife will be like his mother, my children will be like his brothers and sisters, if he had them. He'll be more at home with me, hygienically, he'll be more like with me, than with that, our Mr. Cunningham, and the pot, you remember? You see, Jesus will be wanting that can, can of water, you, won't, you haven't got it? Look, he'll be more at home with us than with you. It is we who are following his teachings, not the Christians. Because you quoted again Peter, you quote Paul, and Paul, and Paul. I said, what did Jesus say? Please, for goodness sake, why didn't you tell me this is what Jesus said? Jesus said, the work is finished, and the work is finished. Let me remind you uh, that the Quran translations for sale on the stage 10 rands for 2 or 7 rands 50 for 1. We thank you one and all and those who put questions we thank you too.